Welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Blank. Super excited that you're here. And welcome to the show, my co-host, Garrett Lynch. What's going on, Garrett? What's going on, Michael? Today, we have Josh McKellen on the on the show. And he is, is focused on the hosp- hospitality industry, but probably not the way you think. And you might think that that industry is in ruins right now through COVID, and it is, but not in the kind of stuff that Josh is doing. So let's find out more about this uh, incredible entrepreneur. <laughs> So look, it's not about that. I would say we got kicked in the gut that first year and I couldn't understand why grandma from New York and Vinny, her son, would F-bomb me like crazy when I was the makeshift restaurant manager those first months and year. Why they hated me so much. And then the next night when our chef showed up, why the other Vinny, Anthony, and Sally hugged me, kissed me, and told me I should come to New York and see him. So one night we perform well, and I'm loved and hugged. The next night we perform poorly, and we're loathed. And Vinny's telling me I ruined his grandma's birthday party, and how could I do that, and I shouldn't be in business, and I'm a scum. And it was because we were struggling through operations that first year, right? So what I took from that, and I mean a lot of hurt nights, like a lot of stress, was something special happens in hospitality. And if you screw with it, people will hate you. (laughs) And if you do it right, people will love you. And I thought to myself, this is different than normal economics. Go to Rite Aid today and have a bad purchase of gum experience. And you're not going to loathe those people. You're just gonna be like, I hate Rite Aid. But if you come to a hospitality experience and we don't treat you great and you feel disrespected, you will loathe us and want us to be closed. And you'll probably want me to go bankrupt. So it's a radical personal experience in hospitality. So what we said is instead of running away from that, what if we own that? And so we're on a trajectory uh, to acquire at least two properties in the next few months. It really is the Super Bowl for us right now. Josh, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Garrett. Yeah, Garrett. So, hey, you know, one of the things that you told me earlier on, which is a a mystery to me, is you have a, a degree in history and theology. What is behind that? I love that you start off with the tough question. So, no, I am a, a student of the liberal arts, uh-huh. and I'm very grateful for the education because it helps you expand your mind and ask questions. So uh, I had a wonderful time doing my bachelor's degree. Then I even taught civics, government, and theology and history as a high school teacher before going into business. That's pretty cool. Now, you were an entrepreneur from early on. How did you get started as an entrepreneur? Yes. Funny story. It's recanted a few times, but it starts with, uh, there's a very crystal moment. And I say that with a joke of selling cotton candy in bags at the, at lunch to my fellow compadres of school. So my mom gets me a cotton candy machine for Christmas and I'm, I'm spinning cotton candy all times of the year, selling it in, in, uh, in grade school, probably like fourth grade or something like that. Did you have a model, a role model for, for being an entrepreneur or where yeah. did this come from? Yeah, uh, I come from one of those opportunities where uh, nothing was handed to us. We were pretty poor. We were actually, I always joke we were one of the first free lunchers. It was my, my mom, who's a handicapped little lady, had a stroke at 27, never worked again. And my father was gone. So she begged the little, uh, you know, the little school if they could give us free lunch. I mean, so we, we, we grew up in that way, but with a lot of joy in our heart. So uh I would call it the mother of uh, invention is necessity. Now, what prompts you? Is that prompt you to be? I thought mean, people would try to just get odd jobs, right? Cutting grass <laughs> or doing that, you know, thing, and and you're <clears throat> you're selling. Yeah, why stuff. am I selling cotton candy? I I guess you know what? Uh, there was a. Th- these are great questions, Michael. Uh, I wasn't ready for them, so I'm proud of you because you knocked me off my feet there. Um, I would say you're right. A gut instinct told me that you sell things instead of try to. Uh, pander for other ways. Now, I was a paper boy at 12. So that, by the way, uh, was a a phenomenal entrepreneurial training. For those of you who are younger than your mid 40s, you may not realize how it used to be, but we literally didn't get a paycheck. What we did is we collected our pay, which means you do the work up front on on consignment of papers, and then you go door to door and sell the price of the consigned paper and I have, to re- I have to admit, what a training. Now that you think back to it, Michael, can you even believe they got away with this? Like, we didn't get a paycheck. We were 12 years old. We're out there hawking their papers at 7 in the morning. So I would say that was then another evolution of my entrepreneurship. But uh, I guess it's ingrained in me. You started out kind of young. Did you ever dabble into kind of the 9 to 5 world at any point? Oh, yeah. And, 
And, I, and did it just not resonate with you? Because I've, I've had that experience personally, but can oh, you talk about that? Thank you so much for asking that question. I want to tell you how grateful I am for everyone that has uh, a career and has a W-2 only because we build businesses now mm -hmm. and our businesses are built on the foundation of fantastic people. So that's like a whole generation we can talk about, about how we treat our culture of our programs and our companies, because we dignify the work. We thank the people. We see it as infinitely, each person of infinite dignity and worth. So going back, no, I've always had jobs. So some 12 years on, I do the entrepreneurial thing with newspapers, 14 on, I work from 40 hours a week from 14 on doing it at nights as a pizza man, uh, literally tossing pizzas. And then by 16, 17, I'm working at a fancy restaurant. I'm the kind of like the catch all bus boy slash Valley Parker. Um, so no, I've, I've never stopped working since then. And what we did after teaching was we, we did all kinds of different careers. So I, I've been employed and still I consider myself employed today. Uh, today we have the privilege of working for companies that our team put together. But no, I, I definitely value a, a great hard work, hard work, 40 hour week. Yeah, there's, Plus. No, there's no question. Now, at what point did you get into real estate? Sure. There is a side story, almost like a sidestep where in 1997, we get married, my beautiful wife and I. And in 98, I convince her that we should buy a duplex. Now, this was so confusing even to me how I came across it. I guess we were shopping in a college town where we had a, uh, we were getting our MBA for free while I worked for the college. And they somehow it crossed my mind that instead of using the mortgage to buy a little house in a college town, why not use it to buy a duplex? So that really taught us for forever to be open-minded about asset ownership. And then later in life, 12, 15 years later, I find the, the purple book. Um, but I would say from 97 on, we've been curious and owning real estate. It wasn't really a career for us though, until um, I got to work in a dream scenario where I helped really, really expensive flippers during the boom, build beachfront houses for $5 million. And I was the project lead for a lot of these, for the houses for the stars. And we were flipping these houses and it was that point on, I've never not been in real estate. So I would say 97, we dabble for about eight years in it on the sidebar. Uh, and then from 07, 05, 06, 07 on, uh, we've been doing it professionally. So talk about what you got to do today here. What is, what is the core yeah. of your business? And you mentioned multiple businesses. So what is it that you, that you guys do today? And maybe we'll fill the gap here uh, between sure. uh, your early humble beginnings and what you're you know, running multi-million dollar businesses now. Yeah, so today we own and we lead uh, something that is, uh, feels like our calling in life, and that is a hospitality development company. So we acquire distressed resorts, which this is our Super Bowl period of, of, of our life because everything's distressed in this new economy. But we have a whole turnaround company program. And so we've been doing that uh, back when I did the house flipping. When house flipping stopped, that same high net worth individual. Um, and I, we started uh, a path of creating ho uh, hotel flips. And so we started flipping things that he had bought to tear down in the boom days. And now it was the recession post 07, post 09. And we turned a few of his dumps into world-class famous properties now. And that taught us a skill that we never knew uh, was so in demand. And so what we are now is two big companies. One is an investor group similar to your kind of uh, uh, audience. We're very similar to multifamily syndicators, but we do it in a very specialized world called resort rehab and repositioning. So we're buying them really cheap. Sometimes we're buying them for land value and that's accountable equity. So accountable equity is my full-time work, my beautiful wife of 25 years now. Uh, sh she and I run that and we, uh, we have a lot of investors. We've raised millions and millions of dollars over the last few years. And what we do is we allow our investors, just like my old high net worth friends, now we do it from all accredited investors, and we buy the resorts that we know how to massively increase their value and force depreciation. So you're going in, you're finding these distressed assets on the hotel side. And now obviously we're, you, you may have experienced this a little bit before in the last recession, but we're, it looks like you know, we're kind of on that forefront again how do you weather that storm, that initial storm? Because it's kind of in, we're kind of in like a scary place right now where Absolutely. it's like, okay, yeah, we could go buy this really distressed hotel, but how long is this going to last? And, and then how do we come up with enough reserves and even forecast that into the future? Maybe talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, Garrett, Michael, you guys are uh, phenomenal, and your audience is enormous, by the way. You guys are so well-respected as giving great advice about syndication and about multifamily and other asset classes. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me answer your question, and then if you want, feel free to uh, add on to the question. But right now, what we're, we're, it's almost like uh, in a very special way we were ordained for this time. And Accountable Equity has been raising capital now for almost three years. And we've been explaining to our investors, here's how we do it so differently than the Marriott's and the Hilton's. We always say, number one, it starts with our core values. And we call our core values, our hospitality name is called Viva May. So French for reviving the soul. So if we run hospitality assets where we put the dignity of the person at the core of everything we do, then we are far, far above uh, the expectations of most people when they show up at our properties. So we end up creating this loyalty and a recurring business model. We also do a few other things differently than the branded hotels or any distressed. Well, look, we're not just uh, arbitrarily buying distressed things. I'll explain our model briefly, but we do something else really well, and that is called sales. And we have a, a training we do here because we're basically a training company, right? So we train our team how to love the guests through a, a form of hospitality that's unique. We'll explain that some other time. If you'd love to ask me, I'd love to answer it. Um, and then we buy resorts. This is cool that are not hotels, by the way, that are resorts. And the difference is, is that resorts have massive quantities of revenue streams. Hotels have one. And the big difference is you cannot survive in the coronavirus with a hotel right now because there's no revenue. But for us, even now, we're ahead of projections from three years ago. And it's because we sell and we're selling resort experiences like weddings and we're doing it in a unique experience, like a winery that's 156 years old in, in the case where I'm sitting today. And we are selling at a clip that ex literally we're up over 200% from last year. Hmm. And it's probably because of the unique nature of our experiences. A lot of them are outdoor, environmentally rich, and weddings have weathered through this coronavirus quite well. Meaning you may not be able to have the wedding you wanted tonight because of coronavirus, but you are happy to spend the money for 2022 right now. And that's what's going on. We have sold out all 21 for the most part. All wedding season is gone. All year is gone for 21. We're halfway through 22. And the coolest part that Michael and I talked about is, again, unlike the Marriott's and Hilton's, I already, we already have their money. And so that fortifies our balance sheet, like, honestly, at a level that you can, it's hard to comprehend what I'm saying to you is I'm saying we actually have the deposit level and I'm talking 25% cash for 2022 and 50% cash for 2021 in our balance sheet right now. You know, you, you said, so you got the, these components that kind of hedge against just the normal hotel business. So the hotel business goes, goes down. People are not staying there. They're not traveling, whatever, but they need to book these weddings. That's, I mean, that's incredible. What percentage would you say kind of are those ancillary items or, sure. um, you know, in a, in a, give us a little bit of a breakdown. You guys are, how, yeah, how you guys are, down. I love doing this comparison too, Michael and Gary, you guys are great interviews. Um, I love comparing it to the multifamily world, which is where I learned how to raise capital. So in multifamily awesome. world, you have multiple, sometimes you have multiple lines of revenue, but the core is the room rent. Yeah. Right. And if you were to analyze a Marriott or a Hilton, they would always start with room rent. It's very similar in that sense. It says normally a hotel room rent is one to two nights and a, and a, a multifamily is two to one to two year lease. So room revenue for us is a trailing indicator, which is so cool because if we've sold, and this is going to blow your mind, if we've sold over four, 550 weddings in the first 20 months of owning this building. Mm -hmm. And while we were under construction, because we buy things that are so bad that we buy them for dirt value, but we fix them. We make them tailor made to the future bride. I always say we're Instagram perfect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, and then while we're building, we're taking their deposit money. So we have the investors capital for the construction, the, uh, deposit capital for operations. And that's how we build a really strong business. So rooms get sold out de facto. Isn't that interesting? Whereas at a normal Marriott, it's, you beg the economy to sell your rooms out. You're like, please God have a convention in my town to sell out my rooms or please God have it be a sunny weekend day in the summer to sell out my rooms. Whereas here we can predict sell out room nights for the next 18 months. 
So how do you do that? Uh, well, let, let's, uh, so let's, let's go through a case study, right? Because I, I think Garrett and I get the value add component. May not necessarily get it in the resort, but paint a picture. Uh, you, what are you looking for? Describe oh, the decrepit yeah. piece for? of property you know, that's underperforming. And, and what does that look like? What are the characteristics right. of this thing? And then what, do you, what, do you, what is your vision for that piece of property? So uh, I'll give the example of Renault, if you don't mind, which is the one I'm sitting at today. But we did just purchase one on the water uh, outside of Maryland, outside of Annapolis, I mean. Mm. Um, here's what we're – I'll teach you the cheat sheet. Um, Love it. This is why people get confused by our business plan. They, they sometimes say, what are you guys, a wedding sales company? <laughs> it sounds well, like that. Well, yeah. Oh, God bless. God bless us. We've determined that we're really good as a team at selling weddings. And, boy, are they a strong indicator of the future success. But – we start with weddings. So if I can find a property, I'll use the example of uh, Renault. This will give you two. two this is the, the vineyard. Renault Vineyard yeah. is the second oldest winery in American history. Really cool history. <laughs> so cool. We bought it with 795 inbound phone calls for weddings. And it was in bankruptcy. Hmm. We wow. bought it from a bank for less than the dirt value, they say. So we bought it, but it already had this pipeline of sales opportunities. So we then capitalized on the sales opportunities and started bringing cash in while we were under control. What was the problem, though? So it's the second oldest. Obviously, it's yeah, probably yeah. beautiful. The land is oh, beautiful. What happens? They're, they're getting the calls, but why was it in bankruptcy? What happened? Yeah, okay. The, the, I want to tell you the real quick. Let me finish the second one, and then I'll go back and answer this because it's the same problem for both properties we just bought. The second one is a, uh, a property on 221 acres on the water outside of Annapolis. Wow. 200-year-old building. 1,200 inbound phone calls for weddings, okay? Both had similar breakdowns and why they weren't successful. Uh, the second one, we had to pay dirt value, a little more even, but not much. And it was because they were actually breaking and paying their bills, breaking even and paying their bills. Uh, the first one was a situation, of, let's go back to Renault. So Renault had an owner for 44 years, phenomenal entrepreneur, made it through the 70s, 80s, and 90s pretty damn well. By 2000 and 2002, Tiger Woods is killing it in golf. What does our gentleman do? He doubles down on golf and builds a $5 million golf course. So it opens in 06. It does great. And then from that point forward, it starts to fail. So the golf course kind of blo bloated his debt and then, of course, didn't provide the revenue that he thought it would. At the same time, he became 80-plus years old. And his decision-making was mired in 1970s. So... A lot of his, what he thought would turn the business around was golf, which we know in resorts, golf can't be the leading revenue source. It just can't be anymore. So he made a couple strategic errors. And then he built, he built us a brand new hotel, though, thank God, while he was building the golf course. So he put $5 million into the golf course and four point five into the hotel. So about nine five and uh, 18 years ago, we bought the whole thing for five. <laughs> We got, and on top of that, we got a 60,000 square foot winery with the licensing rights to use the word champagne and all these historic, uh, unique features that you can't buy anymore. And we paid none of nothing for that or the golf course. I always joke, all we paid for was either the dirt or just the hotel, but we didn't pay for all of it. We then renovated it. So, uh, what you find in independent resorts like ours are really older and tired owners. So it's very similar to what I remember my friends like Dave Zook used to tell me about self-storage five years ago. He's like, we're buying it for mom and pops. So we're corporatizing the model and we're, we're pulling out all the value. Yeah. Well, we're doing that at like a tenfold compared to what you can do in other factors. Because remember, the gentleman we bought it for him really put weddings at the bottom of his priority list. He put golf at the top of his priority list. And he put the hotel as like top of his priority list next to golf. Well, we couldn't sell this hotel out because we're a destination wedding unless I had a lot of demand sources and golf's not going to give you room nights. It's weddings are going to give you room nights. So what we did is we flipped the model, twisted it, pounded in on, on the, the massive revenue generator, which is weddings in this case. And now we're uh, on trajectory to uh, quadruple the price of the property through forced appreciation in the first two years. That's incredible. So, so you're starting with the weddings. You're like, listen, let's yep. build a good sales team yep. around the weddings and the rest should take care of itself as long as we have that stream. And you're kind of flipping the model. Flipping the model. So I love that. And how do you guys even go about finding something like this? Because it's yeah. not, you can't just go on LoopNet and find a, you know, winery, right? Like that, like you got to be a little bit, 
a little bit uh, creative, I would imagine. Yeah, we are being creative these days. As a matter of fact, this is a clarion call for all of your listeners. If you are aware of an independent resort that's either on the water, has some type of amenity, like a golf, like a waterfront, like a marina, anything, and the owner is tired, distressed, and ready to go, call us. Because we are buying from here down to Florida for right now. We're a Northeasterner company. We have credentials uh, all the way up to Wall Street Journal rankings for best hospitality business at one point. All the way. So we want to get from where we're at in Jersey. Now we're in Maryland. We want to keep going south. Um, but we really can, but we can be agnostic to what makes it a resort. So we've looked at ski resorts in the past on the West Coast uh, in Utah. We can be agnostic to what it is that makes it a resort, but it can't be a hotel because hotels have no demand generation. They are, they are servants to the market. Whereas a resort with, with entertainment, with weddings, with other amenities marketed, we create our demand. And that's how we're getting through the Corona. And we're actually doing quite well during Corona. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, in order for this to work, and I see some perils in things like self-storage, for example, where you have to be the operator. It's very difficult to outsource the operations. And it sounds like you're doing this yourself. In fact, you call yourself a hospitality company, first and foremost, with real estate, of course, being a necessary thing. But what makes you guys a good oh, operator? I know you're dying to answer that question. A good I operator. I'm dying. A, yeah. <laughs> Right, so you're Michael, obviously um, you're, pay, you're focused on people, on systems, on the customer. Yeah. What makes you uh, really be a good operator? Yeah. Uh, somewhat, so, uh, it's not going to be a tall, it's not going to be a very long story. But I want to share with you the heart of what happened. So when we were back with that other company trying to uh, pick up the pieces after the recession, and the very high net worth family had bought a few dumpy hotels on the beach, so resort style. And he planned on tearing them down, but the economy wouldn't allow it, right? So pre-economy, he could tear it down and build a new building and still make money. Post-recession, uh, you better hold on to the structure you have and fix it up. So we came up with a model to fix it up. Well, at first, we thought we were house flippers on a massive scale, which means construction, really cool design, all those skills that we had been honing for years in house flipping, we brought to the resort world, and we love it. We have a team of architects and everything. Well, we were wrong. We were dead wrong. Hospitality. Um, in the way I'm answering all your questions, there's so many unique trigger words that I'm throwing out there. Like the fact that I've never called it hotel business or, uh, uh even resort business. It's a hospitality business. So ho the main major, uh, vernacular there is it's a person business. Mm -hmm. So hotels or buildings, hospitality is a guest, by the way, we haven't had a customer here since uh, 1999, as they say, no, we, we only have guests. So we treat, everything's oriented different. When you arrive your first time, you're told, uh, you're greeted by a, a terminology of welcome home. It's very special. Um, so what happened was we built the building. We then turned it over to a hospitality third party and they, cru they got crushed because seasonal luxury, because that's what we build, four or $500 a night properties. Uh, seasonal luxury in the Northeast uh, gets frequented by New Yorkers and Philadelphians. They're very demanding. And the hospitality company came in thinking, we'll run this like a Marriott. Well, you get go from like 4% occupancy to 100% occupancy in one weekend. And it never stops. And they got crushed and people quit after quit after quit. So they went from a 25, 30 person staff down to a 15, down to a nine. And they were, what they were doing is they were just sacrificing. And so they imploded, we took over. And it was at that point that we said, uh, well, I will tell you, we got kicked so hard in the gut for about a year, my friend, that that's really where it all came from. And being kicked in the gut means I'm the president of a company, I'm the design guy, and all of a sudden, I'm the restaurant manager. I'm the bus boy. I'm helping the front desk. I'm doing whatever it takes to dig us out of this hole in 2012 and 13. And we came up with a principle that if you, if you turn hospitality into a ministry, um, a gift to others, then you can, first of all, find peace doing the work, find joy doing the work, and then transform the experience for the guests. And that's why we went from charging 350, 450 to 550. The first few properties I ran ended up getting to almost $1,200 a night some nights and became the nationally ranked top 25 hotels for four years in a row on TripAdvisor. So all that really exciting stuff came down, in my opinion, to three words. And so our new company that runs the hotels, like consider our Viva May brand as if it's the Marriott brand. You know, Marriott doesn't own buildings anymore. They just run them. 
You and I can buy a Marriott, Michael and Garrett. We can raise money and buy a Marriott building, never do a darn thing, have Marriott sign a contract, and they run it, and they'll do a good job uh, pre-recession. But uh, what we did with Viva May is we said, what if the whole thing was based on three core values, joy, humility, and ministry? And if we teach our staff to find joy in this type of work, and we appreciate them, and we meet every single week and go over this, not, it's not just me anymore. We teach it every week. and, and those three core values have, have made us a top-ranked hospitality company. Now, why ministry? That's a very unusual corporate value. What do you mean by that? So at first, uh, I would say uh, first six years pre-creating uh, Viva May, I didn't call it ministry. Uh, we called it uh, passion or something like that. And when we, three years ago, got to create these companies from scratch the right way, in our opinion, we reevaluated what what's really happening at that experience. So so many intimate, personal, human, intimate things happen in hospitality. Everything from great food to spirits and great drink to sleeping and relaxing. And of course, uh, ministry to me, we ended up defining it by Googling it and everything like that as simple tasks done for spiritual reasons. And so what we've done is we've said to our staff, what if, what if we do the same things, which is deliver a cheeseburger in an efficient amount of time, deliver a great meal in an efficient amount of time, have the best drinks and cocktails. But we don't do it to pat ourselves on the back for having the prettiest cocktail, but we do it on the back of making the other guests feel loved. So if the intention isn't the, the, the object, it's the experience, everything changes. And you end up getting more fulfilled. So you as a team member become more fulfilled that you're doing something great for the other. And it's just a very others focused model and uh, ministry to us is the fastest word to shock every interviewee, to shock everybody who ever hears it into realizing we ain't doing it the old fashioned way. We're doing it the ancient way because hospitality, if you look it up, has this word called the ministry of hospitality was like the ancient way of doing hospitality. As a matter of fact, we looked that up too and we said, why was it originally called the ministry of hospitality? And it turns out, this is where it gets really cool and I'll shut up after this, but the word hospitality has, it, okay, in Latin, it's hospes, H-O-S-P-E-S. And that's what we would have said, us English speakers, for a thousand years while Latin took over Europe, right? But now in English, we get to call it hospitality. Guess what hospes means? It means three English words, hospitality, hospital, and hospice. So for a thousand years, people knew that hospitality had a ministry power. And we have lived through hospice just last month. My father-in-law passed away. Mm. And we saw the gift of hospice, which is that time where medicine doesn't work anymore. And you're thanking the person for all the good they did in this world. Wow. That is incredible. So, you, I mean, obviously the, the vision part of this company is super important. And how long did it take you to kind of discover this? Cause this is, this is some deep stuff and this is really <laughs> powerful stuff. And I'm sure there was, there was a lot of, a lot that went it into was, this right. behind the scenes. Talk about that. I mean, what, what failures did you experience to get yeah. to this level that you just, that, the, what you just pr produced right now was incredible. So talk to me. <laughs> Michael and Gary, you guys are great to even ask these questions. This is my heart. This is why we do what we do. Um, we lost for about a year after that other management company collapsed, uh, we were in a tricky spot. This is before we were able to build Viva May and Accountable Equity. This is really, to me, the, it's almost like I've been living a prototype of this company for eight years or six years, and then for the last three years, building the world's perfect model. We're basically going back to ancient form of hospitality and trying to encapsulate it, and we're modeling it on syndicated ownership. So it's really this beautiful blending because when you own resorts, um, it's a, there's an implicit privilege to be an owner of a resort, right? I mean, we have some, if you Google us right now, Google Renault winery resort, you don't have to, but if you did, you'd look Literally. at Instagram, Instagram's flooded with thousands and thousands of devoted, loving fans of this new thing. We're talking about Viva May service and Renault style, right? Which we pulled it out of the ashes, ashes. It was a Phoenix out of the ashes. So it looks world-class. I've had people from Napa say we're better than any Napa vineyard for an experience. Our wine is unbelievable now. We've changed that over the last 18 months. So 
the, the proof is in the pudding, but I'm sorry, the privilege in the ownership is astronomical, Michael. So we're returning double digit yields. We're, we're forcing appreciation. Our first year, we went from an acquisition of 5 million to an appraised CBRE value of 19.5 in, in less than one year based on wow. sales contracts. So what, what had happened was we were under construction. We had spent the money on the property. We delivered at that first year, I think we got 200 wedding sales, which is, by the way, the best wedding experience you've ever been to. Think of that place, call them and ask them how many weddings they have a year. And it'll be between 50 and 75 for a world-class wedding venue, not 500. We're on pace now to be doing like more like 300 a year because we have scale. We have five ballrooms and we have outdoor vineyards and we have all kinds of unique stuff. So look, it's not about that. I would say we got kicked in the gut that first year and I couldn't understand why grandma from New York and Vinny, her son would F bomb me like crazy when I was the makeshift restaurant manager those first months and year, why they hated me so much. And then the next night when our chef showed up, why the other Vinny, Anthony and Sally hugged me, kissed me and told me I should come to New York and see him. So one night we perform well and I'm loved and hugged. The next night we perform poorly and we're loathed. And Vinny's telling me I ruined his grandma's birthday party and how could I do that? And I shouldn't be in business. And I'm a scum. And it was because we were struggling through operations that first year. Right? So what I took from that, and I mean a lot of hurt nights, like a lot of stress was something special happens in hospitality. And if you screw with it, people will hate you. <laughs> and if you do it right, people will love you. And I thought to myself, this is different than normal economics. Go to Rite Aid today and have a bad purchase of gum experience. And you're not going to loathe those people. You're just going to be like, I hate Rite Aid. But if you come to a hospitality experience and we don't treat you great and you feel disrespected, you will loathe us and want us to be closed. And you'll probably want me to go bankrupt. So it's a radical personal experience in hospitality. So what we said is instead of running away from that, what if we own that? And so we're on a trajectory uh, to acquire at least two properties in the next few months. It really is the Super Bowl for us right now. Uh, imagine buying multifamilies at 25% of the price they were three years ago or 40% of the price they were three years ago. Uh, if you believe the world of hospitality is over and if the world of weddings and things like that, then don't join accountable equity. But if you believe that there will be a, we're in a trough and that there'll be a somewhat of a climb, may not be a V or anything like that, then that's why people are joining us at Accountable Equity, because they're thinking, I'm buying legacy assets on the water in Annapolis for the price of dirt. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, and uh, I went through a similar experience where I kind of went through a giant trough in an attempt to try to make money and didn't, lost everything. And then I kind of scratched my head and go, what am I doing wrong here, right? And it's always a, a perspective where I was trying to make money and take care of me. And during this time, I was like, man, something is fundamentally wrong. And I figured out that it's got to be about others. And I developed kind of a mission-based approach, which is why I have a shirt called Freedom. I decided I was going to help people become financially free. And when I started shifting my mindset around serving others, because I was already on the floor anyway, uh, things that naturally changed for me. And it sounds like they did for you as well. And I know a lot of people who, uh, who, who have made lots of money, lost it all because, because their, their, their heart wasn't in the right place. And I find that very interesting. And I, this is why I say people don't, don't, think, you know, don't think about making money necessarily. Think about how you can serve other people, right? And, and that's really, really powerful. And it sounds like that's kind of what happened to you. Yeah, and then and we got to, I mean, you and I have some mutual friends, the, the real estate guys, Russ and Robert. So they're the ones that helped us put together Accountable Equity. And what they did was they helped me see, because I went to many of their courses and spent time with them, that everything I love about hospitality is beautiful, right? That's what I'm probably called to do. And we're good at it. And we're, we're working, we're building teams. We have 100 people. But what about the fundraising part, right? Is the fundraising part the afterthought? Or is it all, does it also have to be respected and cherished? And, I, you know, we kind of went through this whole epiphany. No, it has to be cherished, meaning not just building beautiful buildings and uh, serving that guest, but perhaps you need to treat your investors as a guest. And so that's why we, um, you know, that's how Russ actually helped me develop accountable equity was what is it you're doing for an investor? It's a little different than what you're doing for the person who needs a great glass of wine. Uh, I think at the heart, they both deserve hospitality, but 
one is so different. And, and so uh, that's why we, we went all in with a group of people and we built Accountable Equity uh, with a similar type of mission. I love by it. The way. So this is actually a great lead into to my next thought here. Um, so how do you structure a deal like this? What, you know, oh. we, we know in multifamily, it's okay, we're doing, you know, some kind of split 75, 25, and then maybe there's a pref, you know, maybe, you know, there, there's something around Great that, question. but talk, talk, talk to us about how you guys, how much CapEx is, is coming from investor capital? Like, how do you finance it? Just tell, tell us a little bit about the mechanics of it because it's super interesting. Yeah, Garrett, great question. You know, at the, at the root, I would say anyone who's ever thought about multifamily syndication will understand the same premise because I use the same yeah. lawyers that do the, my uh, sure. PPMs. Here, <laughs> here's how we do it. Uh, we came up with what I believe to be an investor-focused model uh, with some differences to multifamily. So for one, we do not have a split up front. What we did, again, I learned from Russ and Gre uh, Robert, was to build a syndication company, not syndication uh, funds. So therefore, what do I do differently? What do, you can see these as pros or cons. We do charge a small asset management fee. That asset management fee keeps everything kosher, allows us to have CPAs on own account and uh, bookkeepers and people. So we have a proper company that's bigger than me has more sustainability than just me. And so you have less points of failure. You have a team. So we do do that. But because we charge an asset management fee, we take zero split until full recapitalization to all capital investors. So I call it a zero 100, right? We, we are not taking a split yet. We'll wait till you're fully repaid plus preference. And our preferences can be up to 8%. So that it's pretty high threshold in a way. You got to get your money back and your 8%. Then we do a 50-50 split. And what we do is we, we're really legacy assets. So we do, we're, we're basically a re, refinance model, guys. So we're doing the forced depreciation. We're spending five years stabilizing that. And then during that time, there's cash distributions. But by the fifth year, and I can beat this, I beat it on all my properties so far, way before the fifth year, we had a full recap. So I can give you the math for my first three properties. First property, we owned it for about eight. We put eight in, that's 16. It took us three years. The NOI after three years was over 2 million. And we pulled out, I think a $37 million valuation and the rest, we, of course, we, we had to use leverage. We paid back all capital. And then we took the excess and bought another two properties. So that was before I uh, created our own company. So we saw that happen in less than four years. So what I said to our current investors is, please give us five years for a recap. Give us two years at least, this is pre-recession, for guaranteed distribution. So we are not, so that's where we start to differ from multifamily. This is a wealth builder. Uh, it's meant to be recapped. It's meant to be um, per legacy wealth forever. So you do, we do ask you for the two-year turnaround. We, at the core of our business, we're a turnaround company. So there is that two-year lag time where we put the CapEx in, we build the stabilized company, and then we can recapitalize at a great rate. Hey, Josh, this has been super interesting. I always love bringing on entrepreneurs like you who are doing things, you know, different things, but so fascinating that you've kind of created this niche and you're, only, you're not only providing value for your investors, but you're really, you're making a difference with the, with the people, with the guests, with your own team uh, as well. So love it. How can people find out more about you? Well, I appreciate that, Mike, uh, Michael. Uh, just hit accountable, accountableequity.com. Two words, accountable equity. It's our mission is in our name. This is how we treat your capital. Uh, hit that there. And right on the, the homepage, you can get more information about what we're doing, um, including our community work. So we always meet every quarter in person voluntarily. Of course, you don't have to come. And we put on a dinner. You see your asset. You meet your team. Uh, we, we invite everybody to that, actually. That's called our Learn and Grow. And we have one about every quarter. So our Learn and Grow experiences, we bring keynotes in. Someday I'll be happy I'm definitely inviting Michael Blanc. Hopefully he'll take us up on it. But I have all kinds of famous podcasters on, Cashflow Ninja, things like that. They're all investors with us. So what I do is I ask them, please come be a keynote. And they do. And they, they bring incredible value. I, I love it so, so much. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Josh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, I find it really interesting that, uh, that Josh focusing on focusing on sales. You know, because the thing that triggered for me, sales is the lifeblood of any kind of business. And I remember uh, there was a couple of uh, properties that we, sh we struggled at on the leasing side. And the, and the weak point was the sales. It was the leasing sales. So when someone actually was called in, the person answering a phone, either the phone wasn't answered at all or it was answered in a weird way or they didn't show up to the appointment or they didn't actually sell, uh, sell the apartment, right? So I think it's, 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 
it is instructive for us to focus on sales in any business we're in. You know, sales is really the lifeblood of any business. And, and so you need to have a program around that. It doesn't matter what business you're in. You have, you have a product. You need to be able to convey that value to somebody else in order for them to buy your product. And so I, I love the fact that, uh, you know, Josh was talking about having that be the forefront of his, of his business, especially in the way that he was selling it, kind of reverse engineering the business. And so that, I think that reverse engineering was, was super uh, creative and, and a way to kind of stay afloat during COVID. Well, that's right. But I love that his definition of value add and, and we have gotten more creative around value add. You'd have a, a normal building and you have the normal things you can do to, to drive value, renovate, increase rents. Okay. I get it. Okay. But now we found some other things and I think you've been very resourceful in kicking, uh, uh, um, actually almost sometimes paying fair market value or asking price because there's things that we can do behind the scenes that actually increase the NOI even further. And, you know, I, I love that. So, for example, in Josh's case, he focused in on the sales. Now, we could do the same thing. You know, if the occupancy is only 85 percent, well, why don't we focus on, on leasing and sales, right? Why don't we develop systems where we have people who are answering the phones who are actively engaged on, on Facebook, for example. We've noticed that we get a lot of leads through Facebook Marketplace, right? Developing a system around that, we can take that uh, onto a property that has poor leasing and lease up activity and really use that as a value add component. Yeah, and it, it really cures all. You can, I mean, if you think about it, if you're good at selling, you can get higher rents, right? So uh, the person that can't sell as well probably will get $25 less or maybe even more because they can't close the deal. Uh, and in addition, if your occupancy is weak, you need to be able to sell those people to, to close them on living at your apartment complex. So it really can solve a lot of problems on, on the property if worked correctly. And so I think that's such a, a key component. Yeah. I, the other thing I liked about it is, you know, even for us is really focusing more on the management of the operations on the hospitality part of this business. Cause in some way we're kind of in the hospitality business. You know, we always talk about, you know, making money, adding value, providing value for our investors. Yes, we do our serve our investors, but we also serve our tenants. And sometimes when you outsource the management to a third party uh, management company, they're going to do a, they're going to do an acceptable job, but they're not going to necessarily create a community out of an apartment building. Right. And so maybe there's a chance, you know, this could be one of those things when we get into our own self management or something, a key component is we develop a little bit more of a hospitality sense to our, our management. You know what? You got to think these, this is their place to live. So your, your residents, uh, you know, they, they, they take a lot of pride in that often and it's very, um, it can be very emotional for people. And so just having people on site and, and people around your residents that are going to be aware of that, I think can make a big impact and a big difference. So that often you see a lot of properties that have, you know, lower reviews even on their, on their, uh, properties because, what happens is people, something goes wrong. Like they don't, they don't, you don't fix something or whatever. And they take offense to that right away. And it's very similar to like an experience in the hospitality world. When something goes wrong, you kind of, you feel an emotion behind it. And so I think creating those systems and, and keeping that high level of hospitality in your apartment complexes can, can really make a difference and create a, you know, just a different culture of, of course on site. You know, one of the reasons I love this business is that we're all born entrepreneurs and, you know, we are constantly facing curveballs of one nature. You know, COVID is being one of them. Curveballs on the one hand, opportunity on the other hand. I think that this kind of environment is really going to separate the strong operators from the, from the weaker ones. And we had a lot of lessons learned over the last three or four years where we did eh, kind of an okay job on operations and we didn't do the best. We made some mistakes, uh, but now we kind of have it dialed in so we can now take our experience and our lessons learned and take advantage of this environment. The last two deals, Garrett, we had, we actually got off uh, off market deals, right? And so we are kind of like Josh. He's this is he's saying this is like the this, he's having a field day with these resorts that are being undermanaged uh, because they're being managed in a traditional way due to due to COVID. And we're starting to see some things as well where a weak operator, for example, the the eviction moratoriums, like you know you have natural turnover, but how do you now get rid of the 
the tenants that you can't evict anymore, right? So a lot of people are hamstrung and we're being resourceful with our manager and, you know, we're uh, actually working with our tenants and if they absolutely can't turn their lives around, we'll pay them to get out of their lease uh, instead of uh, chasing them and collections. And we've been very successful with that. So what I'm saying is, you know, a lot of people are sticking their, their head in the sand going, oh, bad time in the market. And my my, you know, my call to action is continue looking for opportunity, continue being the opp- entrepreneur that you are, which is being resourceful, dealing with challenges on the one hand and taking opportunities of other ones. And that's kind of what I love about our guest Josh here today. Yeah. So you can't ignore what's going on in the world right now. You can't ignore COVID. The way that you can prepare for it is to make sure that you account for the worst case scenario when you're going out and searching for deals. So as an example, you know, we doubled our economic vacancy just in case um, in our underwriting, just to make sure that we're covered in that, in that side, because there are going to be opportunities. You know, I think, I think multifamily has been a little bit slower to realize some of those, um, but they are coming or they already have started to come. To be honest, that's what we've taken advantage of it now twice. And so, Uh, You need to look out for that kind of stuff and then just prepare for like a worst case scenario in underwriting. And if it makes sense, then go after those deals. Right. So definitely be cautious in these times, but do not stop looking for opportunity. You may have to adapt some of your tactics. Garrett mentioned uh, changing your underwriting for sure, but it does not mean that you should sit on the sidelines because over the next 12 months, enormous wealth will be created as uh, more and more opportunities arise. So with that, thanks for your time. Keep moving forward. Catch you next time. Hey, and before you leave, make sure you subscribe to my channel below. We put out videos every single week and you don't want to miss it. Also, if you haven't done so already, grab my free ebook here, okay? It's a secret to raising money to buy your first apartment building deal. It's a good one, so grab that. And hey, check out another video.